The Chase Sapphire Preferred is probably the best mid-tier card for most people, giving you great value, perks, and benefits, while being the centerpiece for the popular Chase Trifecta along the Unlimited and the Flex cards. I've probably had this card for over 5 years now and have only had great experiences. From earning hundreds of thousands of valuable Chase points, to redeeming for travels for my close ones and I, to saving money every time I do car rentals. So in this video, we'll go over why I no longer have the card, why it's so good that I want to apply again, and a full live walkthrough of the application process and best chances of approval. So like I said earlier, it was kind of bittersweet a couple months ago when I got rid of my Sapphire Preferred card. At the time, I realized it was more on the back burner because most of my spend was being put on the newer Chase Inc cards as well as my Catch All Venture X card. So instead of continuing to pay the $95 annual fee, I decided to product change over to the no annual fee Basic Freedom card and then also got part of my annual fee and reimbursed because it's prorated. And the basic freedom is just like the Freedom Flex card that offers rotating 5% categories up to the same $1,500 cap every quarter. Which means between the Freedom and the Freedom Flex cards, I get double the limit on those 5% categories. But thinking about it more now, I do have a couple major purchases coming up and a major trip, so I am looking for a new card. And with the recent reintroduction of the 80,000 point offer on the Chase Sapphire Preferred, it definitely got me thinking about it again. Especially since I first got my Sapphire Preferred back in September of 2017, meaning the latest I would have gotten that bonus would have been three months later, so December of 2017, which then means it's been over five and a half years now since I would have gotten a Sapphire bonus, which far exceeds the 48 month window between bonuses, meaning I would technically qualify. And honestly, I never thought this day would come because when I first got this card years ago, they introduced a 24 month rule and a few months later introduced a 48 month rule which was a big bummer. But why? What's so good about this card that makes me recommend it to most people and makes you want to apply for it again? Well, of course the elevated welcome bonus is a huge chunk. Because the 80,000 points you get after spending $4,000 in the first 3 months is a big deal. Even if you value the points at 1 cent per point, so the straight cashback route, that's still $800, which is more than 8 times the annual fee. And with a higher value of 2 cents per point, which is what I value my chase points at given the amazing redemption options, that's $1,600 of value. Another reason is being able to use this card without paying foreign transaction fees while still earning valuable points through the three times on dining and two times on travel, even when I'm outside of the US. Because right now, the only card that will give me some valuable points when I'm outside of the US is my Venture X with its two times miles on all spend. I'll also hopefully be able to use the $50 hotel credit each anniversary year, especially when traveling to places that don't have amazing point redemption options, or I just need a quick stay or two. Then there's the partner benefits. Now I probably still won't use them all, especially Instacart, maybe GoPuff, but the one I miss the most is DashPass. Too many times have I wanted to order food for delivery, but then felt bad because I had to pay the delivery fee and not have the slight discount from having DashPass. I mean, it's not about the couple dollars being saved, but you just get so used to having Uber One or DashPass. But above all of that, if I wanted to use my Chase points today, the best redemption is probably cash back at a one cent per point rate. If I get the Chase Sapphire Preferred card, I could then pull my points onto the card and then redeem those points at more optimal rates. For example, I can redeem for travel through their portal at a 1.25 cents per point rate. Or two, which is my favorite, transferring them to one of Chase's travel partners and redeeming that way, usually getting upwards of two cents per point in value. And that's something I went through booking two major trips this year before I went through the product change. With trip number one being on EVA business class, 
flying from the US over to Taiwan and Japan. A trip that was made possible transferring my chase points over to Aeroplane, tacking on the 30% bonus last year, and then booking for about 123,000 points each, valuing them at just over 5 cents per point. Or trip number two, booking Singapore Airlines business class for my parents and I flying from the US over to Singapore, Korea, and Japan. Also through transferring to Aeroplan and valuing my points at 5 to 6 cents per point. Both of which far exceed the 2 cents per point average that I hold my Chase points at. And so with earning a lot more Chase points, especially through my Chase Inc cards, getting the Sapphire will allow me to transfer and book whenever any deals come up. Now, as with any card application, I think it's useful to give you a snapshot on the different elements that feed into my credit profile. First, Checking Credit Karma gives me an estimated read into my TransUnion and Equifax scores, which both sit at about 796. And digging further shows that I have a 100% payment history, a 1% credit card use, and two hard inquiries in the past while, probably from my Chase Inc cards, and with a total credit limit of about $90,000. I also have about seven or so accounts, as well as a credit age of about three years and four months, which are probably the two lowlights of my credit profile. I think I forgot to spend on one of my older cards and it got shut down, which pulled down my credit age. If we go over to Experian, which is the more common credit bureau that Chase pulls from, it shows I have a pretty similar score at 791 and the same 1% credit usage. That said though, there are multiple data points online showing people getting approved for their card with credit scores in the mid to high 600s. So don't let that rule you out. And then since this is a chase card, we'll want to consider the 524 rule saying that you'll be denied if you've had more than 5 new cards in the last 24 months. In my case, I'm well under the rule at about 1 or 2 new cards in the last couple of years. I did open 2 new Chase Inc cards within the last year, but although you need to be below 524 to be approved, once you're approved, those business cards do not contribute to your personal 524 count. One thing I have to keep in mind though is the temporary credit score hit I'd have from the hard pull over the next couple months, which looking at my history has dropped my credit score about 10 or so points and took a couple months to rebound back. And because I'm planning to get a car soon, it probably will have a small effect on the auto loan. But hopefully interest rates are going to continue to go down and I can just refinance like a year later. Alright, so you want to apply for this card and I want to apply for this card. What are the best ways to do so? Well, there are a few ways. First, you can get physical offers in the mail with these elevated welcome bonuses. Though unfortunately, I haven't seen any in my mailbox, but maybe you have. Second, I would consider applying in branch. From what I've heard, the employees there are really helpful and want to help people apply for new cards. And so they'll guide you through the process and help you through any issues that you might encounter. As of the time of this filming, I believe that the in-branch offer of 90,000 points still exists, but does require a higher $6,000 of spend instead of 4,000. So it's up to you if that 10,000 extra points is worth the 2,000 in extra spend. In either case though, there has been higher offers in the past, like 100,000 points for the same amount of spend, but that seems to be pretty rare. Third, you can go through certain websites to see if you're pre-qualified or pre-approved. For example, Cardmatch is a great place to see which cards you are pre-qualified for, as well as checking your own Chase account to see if you have any offers. Then there's also the Chase pre-approved page, but it doesn't seem to be available, at least for me right now. And then the final way is of course going through the typical online portal and the regular application process, which we'll go through here. All right, so now that we're on the application page, let's go over what you need to fill out and where. First off, you have your first name and last name with an optional middle name, which is used to identify you, of course, and have it shown on your card. So we're gonna fill that out here, and a suffix if you have that. 
Of course, you have your date of birth and then your mother's maiden name, which I believe is used as a security question if you ever need to. Next, you're gonna need your social security number, which is of course self-explanatory. And then of course, your address, your email address, and your mobile number. So let me go through and fill those out real quick. All right, now this next section is pretty important. Not only will they pull your credit report given the information above, they'll also want to know what type of residence you're in. For example, if you choose rent, they'll want to know how much you're paying for housing every month, likely to calculate your expense to income ratio. On the other hand, if you choose own, then it won't ask you, but that's probably because you'll have a mortgage and they'll already know about that when they pull your credit report in order to then calculate your debt to income ratio. Next would be your employment status, whether you're employed or not, or if you are, if you're self-employed. Here, I'm gonna choose employed. And then of course, your gross annual income. And you wanna be sure to include all your income here from your regular job, any side hobbies you have, stock trading, interest, dividends, as well as any type of income or help you get to pay off your bills or rent every month. So let me go ahead and fill that out and then we'll continue. Next, they'll ask if you wanna go paperless, which I put yes here, and if you wanna add an authorized user for free. And you can do this later anyway, so I probably will just skip this for now. And then of course, reading through every single word of the pricing and terms, the different interest rates you'll occur if you don't pay off your bill every month and all the other terms, as well as going through the certifications to make sure that everything you put in this form is true and correct. So I'm just gonna go through and review everything once over, click I've read and agreed to the above, and then go through the application process. All right, all good. Let's see what happens. Cool. All right, looks like I've got approved right away with about a $23,000 credit line and the purchase APR, which of course, if you never hold a balance, shouldn't really matter. Uh, enrolled in paperless statements and the card should arrive in five to seven days. Cool, and that's it. Pretty simple application process for an amazing card. If you get approved, congratulations. It's one of the best cards anyone can get. If you need to wait for a response or get denied, you can always call in and check on the reason why because there are times where there's just a typo or a mistake on your application that they can then correct and continue through with the application, but your mileage may vary. In either case, having the Chase Sapphire Preferred is amazing. But like we mentioned earlier, it really shines when you combine it with other cards in the Chase lineup. So go on and check out this video for the Chase cards to focus on. Thanks for watching.